In this video, we're going to look at two interesting limitative results about what you can express in the language of first order predicate logic. Remember, we've already seen that sets can be finite or infinite, and among the infinite sets, they can either be countable or uncountable. The two results that we're going to look at will tell us something about both of these boundaries. We're going to look at what the language of predicate logic can express about the difference between finite and infinite, and we're going to look at what we can model about the relationship between countable and uncountable collections. So let's look at the first issue. We'll look at the distinction between finite and infinite collections of formulas. This first result that we're going to prove is what's called the compactness theorem, which says that if A is a consequence of a set of sentences X, then it must have been the consequence of some finite subset of that set of sentences. If you're just looking at the definition of validity in terms of the presence or absence of a counterexample, you would never know this. I mean, if all I tell you is that there's no counterexample to an argument from X to A, that means there's no model where all of the sentences in X is true, where A is false too, then it's not at all obvious that we can't find a counterexample to finite subsets uh, of X. Because if X is an infinite set, then it's imposing more constraints on the models and is not obvious at all that I could restrict the set to some finite subset, which also doesn't have a counterexample. But this is where the soundness and completeness theorem, which tells us that what we think about validity, we could also uh, think in, instead in terms of provability and proofs. That's where this is going to come in so handy. Because using soundness and completeness, we can prove the compactness result just like this. We can prove that if there's a proof from uh, my premises X to my conclusion A, then there has to be a finite subset X prime uh, of those premises, which is enough to prove A. And then once we've proved that, we can appeal to the completeness uh, and soundness theorem, which tells us that provability and validity are equivalent. So let's, let's do this. Suppose that we have a proof from X to A. Call that proof pi. What that means is that the proof pi ends in A, and the premises uh, that are undischarged are all in X. The important facts about proofs is that they're finite. So the only finitely many formulas appear, and so only finitely many of the formulas that are in X uh, are used in this proof and only finitely many of those can be undischarged assumptions by the time we get to the end. So look at all of the undischarged assumptions that are left and call them X prime. This proof is not just a proof from X to A, it's a proof from X prime to A. So we can reason like this. If the argument from X to A is valid, then by the completeness theorem, we've got a proof from X to A. By the argument that I just gave you, that proofs are finite, we've got a proof from some finite subset of X to A. Call that finite subset X prime. And then by the soundness theorem, the argument from X prime to A is valid as well. So we've proved the compactness theorem. If the argument from X to A is valid, then the argument from some finite subset of X to A is also valid. Now, of course, that doesn't mean the argument from any finite subset to A is valid. There might be some particular premises there which have to be used. If you look at the proof, we just look at what premises were used in the proof that you chose, and they're the ones uh, that you need. The other ones were innocent bystanders which weren't used in the proof. This theorem is really powerful, and we're going to look at one of its consequences about what we can express and what we can't express in the language of predicate logic. Here is a, an inexpressibility result which follows from the compactness theorem. We're going to show that there is no sentence phi 
I'll just call it phi, in the language of predicate logic, which is true in all and only the models with finitely many objects in the domain. So what that means is that there is no way in the language of predicate logic to say that there are exactly finitely many things. Any sentence which is true in all of the models with a finite domain has got to be true in some models with more than a finite domain, where the domain is infinite. Or if you've got a sentence which is only true in models with finite domains, it's not going to be true in all of them. There's going to be no way to cut exactly at the boundary between finite and infinite with a sentence in the language of predicate logic. So there's no sentence which has got this meaning, there are finitely many things in the language of predicate logic. So you can see how this is called an inexpressibility result. There is no way to say something which has this meaning in the language that we have. So this is a very strong limitative result. It's saying here's a thing that the language can't do. Here's a distinction between models where there's no sentence in the language which expresses that distinction. This is unlike the distinction for any particular finite number. I can say there's exactly one thing. This sentence here does that. This sentence is true in all of the models where the domain just contains one thing and is false in any other model. This sentence says there is something, call it Y1, such that everything is identical to it. It's true if there's one object in the domain, and if there's two objects in the domain, it's got to be false. If there's three objects in the domain, it's got to be false. If there's any more numbers than one of objects in the domain, it's got to be false. This sentence, there's a y1 and there's a y2 which are different, and everything is either identical to y1 or identical to y2. This says there's exactly two things. And so if I wanted to say there's either one or two things, I'd just do the disjunction of these two sentences, say that one or two of those is true. Similarly, this says that there's exactly three things, and you could go on and make a longer sentence which says there's exactly four things, and you could at least write out a definition of what the sentence, getting longer and longer and longer, has to look like if you wanted to say that there's exactly seven things, or exactly 3,088 things, or exactly a million things. Uh, for any particular finite number, you could say there's exactly that many things. Just using a language of a formula in the language of predicate logic, using the identity predicate. What we're going to use the compactness theorem for is to say that there is to show that there is no way to say that there's exactly finitely many things. Uh, there's no way to, in one sentence, do something which is like the disjunction of all of these sentences in this list. Uh, that would be infinitely long if I was just disjoining all of them, and there's no sentences which are infinitely long. And this theorem will show us not only does that not work, but there's no other way to say it either. So here's how we're going to do this. We are going to give what, what we could call an overspill argument. That is, we're going to show that if our formula phi is true in every model with finitely many objects, it's going to also be true in some models with infinitely many objects too. So this sentence is not going to cut at that boundary between the finite and the infinite. It's going to spill over and allow other models to also satisfy it. So we make the assumption that phi is some sentence that's true in every model with finitely many objects in the domain. And now we consider this big set of formulas phi just by itself, then this formula here which says there is not just one object. This is the negation of the formula that says that there's exactly one object. And then this sentence which says there's not just two objects. And then this sentence which says there's not just three objects and so on. We're going to add all of these sentences which says there's not just one, not just two, not just three, not just four, not just five, not just six, not just seven, for every finite number. 
if I look at this whole set of sentences here, every finite subset of this set is consistent. The first two sentences are true in any model with at least two things. The first three in any model with at least three things. The first four in any model with at least four things, and so on. If you pick out some finite number of these, I just pick the largest one among them and have a model with more than that many objects. That is going to be a model of each of the individual counting ones along the list, and also phi, because phi is designed to be true in every model with finitely many objects. So what we've got is a set of sentences where every finite subset of that set of sentences has a model. We can therefore apply the compactness theorem to say that the whole set of sentences has to have a model too. But no model of all of these formulas, I mean all of them, can be finite because the first formula says it's not just one thing, second says not just two things, third says not just three things, etc. So the result of this is that our starting sentence phi has to be true in some infinite model because the only way to make all of these sentences true is for the model not to be finite because any particular finite number has been excluded. So we've got this inexpressibility result. We can say there's five things. We can say there's seven things. Uh, we can say for any particular number, there's that many things. But we can't say in the language of predicate logic that there's finitely many things. Or we can't say that there's infinitely many things. We could say things that imply that there are finitely many things, but it will be a bit more specific than that. We could say something which implies that there's infinitely many things, but it will have to be a bit more specific than that. There's no way to say just that there's finitely many things or that there's infinitely many things using the conceptual resources of first order predicate logic. If we're saying that somehow, we must be doing it in some other way. So that's one limitative result between finite and infinite. We're going to look at another limitative result, looking at the boundary between countably infinite and uncountably infinite. We'll call a model countable when its domain can be enumerated, when its domain is a countable set. And we're going to look at the difference between models with uh, countable domains and models with uncountable domains. In fact, we're going to show that if I've got a set of sentences which has got some model with an infinite domain, then we're going to be able to construct a model where the domain is countable. There's going to be no theory in a language which is countable, which can force there to only have models of an uncountable size. We'll prove this countable model theorem, which says that if I've got a set which is finite or countably infinite itself, and it has a model, then it has a model with a finite or countable domain. Again, I reckon this is pretty surprising uh, because we've already seen reason to think that some collections have to be uncountable, you know, like the bit streams. And so it means that if I've got some theory in the language of first order logic, which is meant to be describing the bit streams, any of these theories, if they've got models, are going to have to have models where the work is all done, not by a collection as large as the collection of all of the bit streams, but a smaller one. It's like, you know, you're discovering that the theory is modeled by some simpler, simplified movie set where it turns out we didn't need all of those characters. We've just got a few of the stars and, you know, a whole bunch of other things are just done by digital simulation or something. And it turns out that there aren't actually uncountably many things in the domain. Three of all of the bit streams will have a model in which there are at most countably many bit streams that are actually in the domain of the model we've constructed. So let's see how we can prove this theorem. If I've got a countable set of formulas which has got some model, then since it has a model, it's consistent. You can't prove a contradiction from it. So we'll just do what we did with the completeness proof before. 
extend the language with a countable collection of new names. And in this larger language, which will be countable because the original uh, set of formulas was countable and we added countably many new names, so there's only countably many new formulas we can make from them. Using this, we construct a witnessed maximal consistent set extending the set that we started off with. This too is a countable set. And so the model which is made from it has a finite or countably infinite domain. The domain is just all of the names that we used. So the result is going to be a model which is a model of the original theory and the domain has to be countable. And that's it, that's a very simple result. It's just noticing that the completeness proof that we, we proved constructs a countable model. It never goes through and has to construct more things in the domain than countably many. We were just numbering off the formulas one by one and throwing in these new names that we needed, but we never needed more than a countable supply. And since the names provide the domain of the model that we construct, this is going to be a countable domain. This means that if I have a theory of bit streams or a theory of real numbers, and the language doesn't have a new name for each different object in the domain, and if you think about it, that's how our languages work. We don't actually have any names that we can write down uh, for each of the real numbers or each of the bit streams. We only ever use shorthands. We can only ever use descriptions of finitely or countably many of them. So our languages don't have a uncountable collection of names in them. And so the models that we're constructing using the completeness proof only have countably many things in the domain. So it turns out that these models can tell us lots of things about these theories, but they're doing it in a way which really does uh, rely on them being models which aren't doing everything that the objects that we're modeling are doing. It's like the difference between uh, a movie set where we're just seeing the surfaces of things, except here the surfaces are all of the things that our language can touch where it comes to describing the properties of the bit streams or the real numbers or whatever else it is that we are describing. It turns out that uh, there's no way for that theory to say things which force there to be uncountably many things in a model of that theory. We might be able to say there is no way to enumerate everything, but that's a statement that says that there isn't an enumeration function. That's not a statement which actually forces there to be uncountably many things in the domain of the model. It's actually something saying that we can't express uh, in our language a way of enumerating things. So this is another of the limitative results of first order predicate logic. We've seen that there's no way in the language of predicate logic to express there's finitely many or there's infinitely many. And we've also seen that there's no way to force a theory to only have uncountable models. If the language is countable, it's going to have countable models too. So these two results, the compactness theorem and this countable model theorem, which was proved by two logicians, Löwenheim and Skolem. And so sometimes it's called the downward Löwenheim Skolem theorem because it shows you how to construct from a model to make a smaller model of a model of a smaller size. There's also upward Löwenheim Skolem theorems, which uh, tell you how to construct from a model, uh, models of larger sizes too, but that's not so important for us. These results were first proved from 1915, 1920 using very different techniques uh, than the techniques that we've used. The compactness theorem was proved by Kurt Gödel in the 1930s as a consequence of his proof of the completeness theorem. Now that we've seen these results, we're going to go further and look at some others of Kurt Gödel's really significant results when it comes to the power and limits of first order predicate logic. And to do this, we're going to have to pay a closer attention to functions and what it is for functions to be computable or calculable.